Hi everyone, it's so good to be with you. You're at home, I'm at home. We're all just at home and now things are opening up and I'm sure you've been able to get out, but let's be honest, the last two and a half months have been hard. And for those who are watching, I'm sure you've chosen this, right? Because you're a parent and I'm a parent and you're a parent. So we know the last two and a half months have, let's just say, a little trying, not super easy. We have been in the same household with the same people over and over again. And as a parent, we love our kids, but our kids are little humans. And so they have little minds of their own and they push little buttons and they're trying to figure out this world. And they have so many boundaries that they're trying to figure out. And when we are stuck home with them, they're stressed out because their world has completely changed. We're stressed out, our world has completely changed. And so I hope today you can find some encouragement. I know the last two and a half months have been hard and exhausting and challenging and tiring, but I also hope that you've had moments to find some rest. You've been able to find some gifts that have been just kind of sprinkled along in this challenging time of the pandemic that we are now living, that one day will be written in history books that our grandkids and our great grandkids are going to be learning about. So I hope that you've been able to look at this and maybe it's been a good thing to shift your perspective and to be able to see some good, wonderful gifts in your home, that you've been able to spend some extra time with your kids. Maybe you haven't been working and you have these moments that are gifts and treasures, more family dinners, a slow down schedule, less places to be and less places to go, and some time to rest and breathe in the sweet moments with our families. And I hope that some of you have had that, if not all of you. My name is Keisha Maybe. I am a counselor and I didn't know about parenting, but I was an expert about parenting before I actually had children. I thought I knew exactly how to parent, that I would be able to help any one parent and I would be able to give these techniques and strategies to people and be able to just give wisdom and I could tell anyone and I would be able to watch people in the stores and tell them, oh, I wish they would do this differently or why are their kids acting this way or why wouldn't they just say no or why can't they rearrange nap time? Why can't they do this? If they do this, this and this, then they will be a tremendous parent and I was the expert parenting before I had children. And then I had my own kids and I have a five, six and a seven year old right now. And so we had them very close together and we had a newborn and a one and a two year old. And I remember being able to like not know time and days would be so squished together. And it was a chore to leave the house and it was a chore to go anywhere. And it was such an exhausting season. And they were so cute. And I remember holding my little boy, my firstborn, and looking at him and thinking, how do people ever get mad at their children? How does it ever happen that this beautiful little person will ever create anger in me? And then they hit about two. And then they really rev into three. And then by four, they are fully like going they are their own little person and they have their ideas and their thoughts and they're trying to insert their own voice and they are trying to have their own boundaries and and they want to see how far they can this world will let them roam and so it can get really challenging and as parents we're only human right like we are doing the best we can and so one of the first things that I hope we can just kind of pause for a second and talk about is parenting is a struggle and people talk about it, but what they don't really talk about is giving yourself grace. Guys, we, so many of us, all of us have had parenting mistakes, moments where we have cried because I can't believe that I said that, or I wish I would have reacted differently. And we all have moments where we did not choose the best choice when it came to parenting. Moments that we could reverse and rewind and erase if we could. But the truth is, is you are humans. You are messy humans with a messy history. And now you are a messy human with a messy history trying to raise humans who are also messy. And so there is some beauty in understanding our role that we are messy individuals. We are going to make mistakes and we are going to yell and we are going to react in ways that we wish we wouldn't. But this is the kicker. If we can give ourselves grace, 
If we can say, I, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that, but it happened, or I wish I wouldn't have said that, and it happened, and now I'm going to give myself grace because I am learning, and I'm going to do better, and I'm going to learn, and I'm going to listen, and I'm going to come to terms with these are, these are my struggle areas, and then I'm going to try to do better and give yourself grace in that. We don't need to beat ourselves up over it. It's not good for us. It's not good for our children. We need to show our children what it's like to give ourselves grace. And when we give ourselves permission to give ourselves grace, then we are also modeling that for our children. We are modeling what grace looks like for our children. That was one word that I really wanted my children to learn really early is what grace is. Grace is getting something we don't deserve. And so many times we are told that we need a parent with this roughness and this toughness and these are the strictness. And yeah, some of that is wonderful. Like we need structure and we need boundaries and there needs to be consequences in our families and in disciplining our children, but also something so beautiful to learn is grace. Extending grace to our children. I remember Levi, my oldest, when he was about two and he could verbalize a little bit more and he did something and I took a toy away and I said, you're, you're losing this toy. And then I gave the toy back and before bedtime and I said, buddy, like I was going to keep this toy longer, but I'm going to give this toy back to you because I'm going to show you grace and grace is giving you something that you don't deserve. And then it can lead into, you know, why we give each other grace. And you know why I'm giving you grace is because Jesus gave me grace. Because Jesus gives us grace. Because grace is such a beautiful thing to teach. We're not striving for, for, for perfection here. We're striving for growth. We want our kids to grow. We don't want them to be perfect. We don't want to hover over them like these expectations, like they have to always be in tow and they always have to perform and they always have to do the, the, they're excellent. We want them to be people who strive for excellence, but we don't want them to be people who strive for perfection. More importantly, I want my children to know that they make mistakes, but there is grace and love. And then there is the chance and the opportunity to grow from those things. And what if we modeled that? What if we taught our children that they make mistakes? We can give them grace. They can give themselves grace and then they can grow and do better. What a beautiful thing that would be if we own that, if we taught our children to own that. Grace, I think above all, is the most important parenting piece that we miss. I've had people that come to me and they say, well, they know better. They know better. Why do they, why do they keep doing this? They know better. And I said, let me stop you real quick. Do you ever yell? Well, yeah. Hmm. Do you ever have moments where you say things that you shouldn't? Well, yeah. And you know better. So imagine you being a, uh, an adult being. Your brain is fully developed by 25. Most of us are probably close to that and older. And so our brains are fully developed. And yet if our brains are fully developed and we know better, and yet we still make mistakes, think of what a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 17-year-old, think of their brains. They're not even fully developed yet. So if we, our brains being fully developed, know better yet still make those same mistakes, let's think about their Let's think about what it's like for them, what it's like from their perspective. And when we can shift that a little bit and understand that we're all just trying, these kids are figuring out their brains are not fully developed, not till 25 if you can even fathom that, right? So sometimes when we say things like, you should know better. No, I mean, they're learning, they're growing, they're changing, they're developing. They are in the middle of a process. And yeah, they need consequences and change and they need people to keep them accountable. But more importantly, they need your grace. They need you to be a safe space. A a space that when they mess up, a space that when they don't get it right, a space when they lie, when they make the wrong choice, that they can come to you and not fear you, but respect you and share things with you. So let me ask you right now, 
Are you creating a safe space for your children? Our children are looking at us, they're taking notes. And a lot of times we have to pause and ask ourselves, is, is the space and the atmosphere that I am creating for them, is, is it a safe space for them? Do they feel like they can come to me? That it's a safe, secure spot for them. And you know what? It's okay to say, you know what? No, there's been a lot of yelling. There's been a lot of quick reactions. They probably don't feel very safe. And guess what, friend? Now we can acknowledge that and we can apologize where apologies are needed and where they're necessary and we can do better. Because that's another thing that is so, so key in parenting is apologizing. Owning up to when you make mistakes, especially with your children. They need to know that you're a human. They need to see that you are willing to own up to your mistakes. Because again, it gives them permission to do the same. We don't want people, we don't want to raise people who can't own up to their mistakes, who can't take responsibility, who deny accountability. We want to raise children who say, yep, I did that. I made a mistake and I am sorry and own up to it and do better. That's the first piece of where grace comes in is admitting, right? That, oh man, I, I royally messed this up. And as parents, we do it. We yell, we scream, we lecture, we interrupt, we break promises. Like these are things that as parents we are doing and we need to not pretend that we didn't do them because right, that shows that we're trying to like act like we're perfect and we don't make mistakes. And let me tell you again, you are not perfect. You are a messy human being trying to raise other messy human beings. So you're gonna make mistakes. But when you do make mistakes, look that little person or that teenage person in the eye and own up to it. I am sorry that I said that to you. I am sorry that I skipped out on that. I'm sorry I forgot about that. I'm sorry I reacted like that. Will you forgive me? I'm going to try to do better. Owning up to our mistakes is modeling that for our children and giving them permission to make mistakes and then be able to try to correct them and own up. We want our kids to be kids who recognize when they make a mistake and apologize for it with sincerity. You're going to make mistakes, parents. It's going to happen. We are humans and we're messy beings. We're so messy, but we're just trying to do our best, but we can't pretend like we don't make mistakes because we do and we need to own up to those. So first, give grace. Apologize where apologies are necessary. If you are not a safe space right now for your family and for your children to be real, to be honest, to come to you, then it's okay to shift and change that right now. We can work on us because we're not perfect. So let me ask you, do you react or do you respond? We, those are two different. They seem very similar, but they're two different things. Reaction is typically emotional. Response is is typically with pause and with thought. So reaction is when little Tommy does something, you're, why did you do that? Didn't you think? Go to your room, go to your room. Or maybe a reaction is trying to spank immediately out of anger, which is a lot of the times just an adult temper tantrum, right? But what if we paused and we gave thought and we responded? instead of reacted. Reaction, again, is with pure emotion. A response is with pause and logical thought. And then you make your move. So I want you just to just evaluate that in yourself and your family. Are we reactors or are we responders? And then when we have that awareness, okay, now I realize that I'm emotional and I'm quick and I react. So we're gonna need to work on that piece. Remember the grace and the apology piece too. We want to get better. We want to grow. Give yourself permission that you've maybe made mistakes and you're going to make them again in the future, trying as hard as you can to be better and grow, but you're going to, be, you're going to make mistakes. But try to be react, responders versus reactors. Reactions with emotion, responders with pause and some thought. And it's difficult 
because I'm going to tell you why it's difficult. I'm going to tell you a piece of the brain that you can see a lot in your kids and you're going to see a lot in yourself that's constantly reacting in this world. So there's this little thing called the amygdala in your brain. And this amygdala is there to help us protect ourselves. It protects, it alerts us when there's in danger. And, and so what happens is when it's alerted, it actually shuts down the ability to reason and it sends us into the primitive piece of our brain, which is what we also could call like an animalistic piece of our brain. So we just react and we just do whatever we feel, whether that's flee, fight or freeze, right? Because we feel like we're in danger, we're re reacting and we're ready to go. And so we feel all the emotion. We're just literally acting like a lion in its pride and some hyena has just come into the pride and we're trying to protect it. I'm not thinking logically, right? I'm just trying to react because I'm emotionally responding. And so that part in our brain is triggered. But let me, let me tell you something too. What's happening is your little child, their amygdala also gets triggered. That's why we have these big meltdowns with kids, right? They have these, these meltdowns that are big and so what happens then is they are their amygdala is triggered and it shuts down their ability to reason and so now they're just acting out of their primitive piece of their brain they are just acting they're reacting the way their emotion whether it's fighting or freezing or fleeing and that's why it's hard to reason what your child when their amygdala is triggered whether they're mad or they're scared or they're anxious, like their body's trying to protect them. And so they're just acting, which is why when you say calm down, it doesn't work. When you say, let's talk about this, it doesn't work because that amygdala needs to be chilled down first. It needs to be calmed down before they can actually listen and have logic and reason with you. And it's hard to get a child to calm down. It's hard to get the amygdala to calm down a child. So it, it's not good when a child is reacting, right? And I'm sure most of you had this moment where you're like, calm down, let's talk about it. Bah, bah, bah. And it's like, oh my goodness, will you just stop it? Now I'm triggered because you've triggered my amygdala. So your amygdala is triggered, but now you're reacting. Now my amygdala is triggered because I feel like I'm in danger. And now you're yelling, I'm yelling, and it's all just crazy, right? <laughs> I'm sure we could all give examples of what those stories have looked like in our house. Stop yelling while you're yelling and bah, it just feels like literally we are in a zoo. And you can probably see now how that piece of the brain, like, oh my goodness, of course, because we're not able to reason as well when the amygdala is triggered. So we need to chill the amygdala out. So helping your child, giving them some space, helping them take breaks, Sometimes using an ice pack will actually, if you put it on the head, will actually be able to lower the heart rate and actually be able to pull some blood away from the amygdala and put it in your frontal lobe, which is actually where you can reason and think. Teaching mindfulness skills to your kids. What do you see? What do you hear? What can you touch right now? What can you smell? What... All of these senses, the five senses can help also bring us back and ground us, but also giving your child space. When they're mad, encourage breaks. When they're, when you, when they're mad and they don't want to talk, maybe you need to walk away for a minute. Because one of the biggest mistakes that parents make is we emotionally react too much. We emotionally react so much. And a lot of this information I'm actually pulling from a great book that I hope you guys will actually order. It's called The Whole Brain Child. And it's by Daniel J. Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson. And it is wonderful because they break down the brain in such a, like a kindergarten level so we can all understand it because the brain is so challenging. It can be really confusing, but they break it down in such a way that as parents, we can understand it. And it's, and it's, it's wonderful. And it'll be able to teach some of this because what our kids need is actually they need validation. And I know a lot, I can't agree with their behavior. No, we're not having you agree with behavior. Validation is actually just letting someone hear that you see how they're feeling, that you see it, that you can tell. So the right part of the brain in a child is more developed than the left part of the brain. And the right part is the emotional piece. And the left part is the logical piece. So a lot of times when we're telling a kid to calm down and stop crying and stop that and stop acting like this, they're, they can't quite connect that yet. So we need to emotionally connect with them first. 
And then we can redirect into the logical piece of the brain and give them steps. So for instance, if little Johnny is throwing a huge temper tantrum or he's really upset, he comes in huffing and puffing. I actually just had this with my seven-year-old today. He was really frustrated over a Lego set and he could not get this Lego set to build the right way. And he was trying to build this house and it was like not, it was flimsy and it was just so frustrating for him. And he came out and just huffed and I said, Levi, you look really frustrated. Like it looks like something is really bothering you. It looks like you are angry. I am. I say, I can tell. I can tell that you're really frustrated and you're angry. And then he was still upset and I asked if he wanted to hug and he said no. I said, well, can mommy have a hug? And he was like, maybe. And then he let me, he let me be able to hold him and we could kind of progress in that. And it's not like an instant thing, but the validation lets them know that you see them, that you hear them, what they're feeling is important. And that you let them process their feelings. It's okay that they're angry. The only thing that makes anger bad or not healthy is, is, if you will, is when we react and we do things in our anger that is destructive and harmful. Anger is an okay emotion to feel. It's part of being human. We don't want to like plant roots there and ground ourselves there forever, but it's okay to feel it and process it. And so we want our kids to have permission to feel anger and to process their anger. So you saying, I see that you're frustrated. I see that you're really angry. Like your body is telling me that you are very upset. And then validating that, now we can move into the logical piece of the brain and kind of help work them out. Let's take deep breaths. Let's talk about it. Can I help you process this a little bit? Can I just hold you and rub your back? Like let's move forward. But to just tell them to calm down and to stop crying, to stop doing that. They're, they're, remember their brain, their amygdala is triggered. So now they're in the primitive piece of their brain. It literally is like telling a lion to chill out because a hyena, like, dude, it's okay. Calm yourself down. It's fine. Stop crying over it. Like, no, they feel, they feel invaded. Their body is telling them that they're not okay and they're not feeling safe. So their body is reacting. It's just the same. So again, we can't reason with a lion when, the, when its pride is being invaded. We can't reason with our children when their amygdala is triggered. So we need to give them space. We give it validation. So Daniel Siegel says to connect and then redirect. And I think that is one of the most the helpful things that I have used in my own home that I've used in giving advice to other people is connect and then redirect. Don't try to redirect. Don't try to immediately solve the problem. Connect with their feelings first. Let them know that you see them, that you hear them, that you understand what is going on for them. That's going to make a huge difference. I know sometimes it's hard, especially for us that grew up in homes that that was not a thing. We did not get validated. We did not have people tell us it was okay to feel. We did not have people say, I see that you're hurt. Let's just sit in that for a minute. We didn't, we didn't have that permission, but that is okay. It is okay to feel, to lean in, to let ourselves process those feelings, to teach our children what it's like to feel and to be able to name their emotions. I feel upset. I feel angry. I feel scared. And that's okay to feel those feelings because that's human. And for us to be able to vocalize our own feelings, I feel sad, I feel frustrated, I feel disappointed, I feel let down, I feel irritated, I feel annoyed, I feel jealous, I feel scared, I feel anxious. To be able to vocalize the feeling and then have our children be able to hear those feeling words and be able to vocalize. Again, a lot of this is modeling. When we give ourselves permission to do healthy things, it's giving our children permission to do healthy things as well. And that's what we want. We want our children to be healthy. We want them to be healthier than we are, right? Like really, that's the hope that we raise children who are healthier than we are. Another thing real quick before we kind of start to wrap up is one of the things that a couple of the the books that I have read. So a couple of the books, um, Transforming the Difficult Child by Howard Glasser. Then The Whole Brain Child, like I mentioned, by Daniel J. Siegel and, and Tina Bryson. And then One, Two, Three Magic by Tom um, 
Phelan, I think, P-H-E-L-A-N, which is great. And he actually says in 123 Magic that the other thing that we do, right, is we have too big of emotions and reactions and then we lecture way too much. We go on and on and on. Have you ever sat, you know, little Tina down and you're like, okay, sweet girl, mom, this is what we do and we don't do this because that could be hurtful and then we don't do this and why would you do that? And these are the options we could try and we could do this. And, and then I don't know if you remember this. I remember getting lectured as a kid and like, blah, 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 wrap it up. I get the point. It's literally like kicking a dead horse and children, their, t- their attention spans, like they're not listening to you. Like you could be preaching a beautiful gospel, but they're not listening. They're, oh, mm-hmm. Oh, okay, mom. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Let's wrap this up. Uh-huh. So they're missing our point. So we don't want to give lectures. We want to be able to give disciplines and consequences that are quick and emotionless. We don't want to give big emotions to negative behaviors because that big emotion is a positive reinforcer to a negative behavior. So we don't want to react so big. Remember, their amygdala is triggered. Our amygdala is triggered. Our, if we're yelling, it's triggering them more. We don't want to give big emotions to these negative behaviors because then it actually gives them attention and gives them emotional reactions of what we crave as people. And then it reinforces the negative behavior. So what we want to do is we want to keep it as emotionless as possible and quick consequences. Transforming difficult child says immediate consequences. One, two, three, magic. You, you, you like do that's one. And they keep doing something or they do something different, that's two. If they keep doing something, that's three. Go take a break and they can play in the room during their break. What one, two, three hopefully does is get them to start processing their own choices and think, well, do I really want to do that? Nope, I don't. I want to make a better choice than that. And hopefully as you continue to do that and read that book, that's an excellent book, a great alternative to just... Uh, a traditional discipline as we think but being able to emotionlessly say that's one that's two that's three take a break let them play let them calm down and then the more you do that the more they're going to say I don't want to get to three I know the this has been a wonderful one in our home yeah we still get to three at times but it's very rare now there's some things that automatic three like hitting and violence the author will tell you is automatic three because we don't want to condone that but that's three, go take a break. We don't need this. That's three, why you keep doing this? I can't believe you. Why we can't keep doing this? I can't believe this. This is so, why are you doing this? Why are you acting this way? And now we're emotionally reacting to their negative behavior, which is positively reinforcing the negative behavior we don't want to continue. And on the other side of the coin, it's we want to have big emotions for their positive qualities that they do display. And not just junk food, right? Like that's the one uh, book, I think it's by the Howard Glasser book where he says, we don't like, we don't want junk food. This is like called the nurtured heart approach. We don't want junk food, like good job, great job. We want qualities being praised. Like, thank you for being so helpful. I saw that you were angry and I saw that you had great self-control because you didn't hit your brother. Thank you so much for displaying such good self-control. Thank you for being so encouraging. Thank you for listening the first time. Like, I love that. Uh, Thank you so much for listening so clearly. Like, these are the things that create safety and peace in our homes. Responding like these, not reactive parenting, not rage parenting, but parenting with purpose and parenting gently. Not emotionally reacting, but responding emotionally and pausing and thinking through what we want to do. We want to create our homes to be safe places for our children, right? We want to give grace to ourselves and to our children. We want to apologize and own up to where it is necessary. We want to create a safe space. And a lot of times we need to look at, am I reacting or responding? We want to be responders, people who pause and think logically about what to do next. We want to not react so big emotionally, but we, in the negative behavior, we want to act big emotionally in the positive qualities when they're displaying positive qualities that we see that they, we want them to have, that we want them to lean into and grow and to praise those. Thank you for listening. You're such a great helper. Thank you for being so kind and thoughtful. Those, you had such great self-control. Those big pop praises, that's what we want. We want emotionless. We want to be able to give these quick consequences. No lecturing, not big emotions. 
We also want to understand what the brain does, right? That amygdala gets triggered. They're angry. They're meltdowning. We can't calm down, stop crying. Nope, they're not because that amygdala is triggered. It's in the primitive piece of the brain. We need to help chill that amygdala out a little bit first. And then when we can chill that amygdala out a little bit, now we're able to reason. That could take time. Some kids, it takes minutes. Other kids, it can take like an hour. Some, you're like, I have one that goes for the three hours. Like, yeah, it's challenging. But that's why we want to teach our kids how to regulate themselves. And again, we can use the, the help ice packs, like those gel ice packs just on the face a little bit for 20, 30 seconds. Helps slow the heart rate down, pull the blood away from the amygdala, put it back into the frontal lobe, deep breathing, teaching them to you deep in, breathe in through their nose. I like four seconds, hold it for seven. Breathe out through the mouth for eight. Being mindful, using your senses to calm yourself down. When my kids are angry, sometimes I'll be like, okay, let's find five things in this room that are blue. And now we're looking for things that are blue and we're trying to ground ourselves in our moment and where we are right now, right here and being present instead of letting our mind just reel, we're trying to ground ourselves and we can teach our children this. And the body is actually really interesting. The body will regulate itself when it finds sensory items that work for its body. So a fuzzy blanket, a squeegee squish ball, a mint, some gum, a jolly rancher, some sounds of the waves, their favorite songs. Um, it can be like some putty, slime. Oh, slime. I mean, I think we all have a love-hate relationship with slime. Probably most of us have a hate relationship with slime, especially if you have a carpet. That can be so icky, right? But things that like, if you can see like a picture, let's use like, let's use something calming, blue and green or pictures of people we love or places we love. And then what can we hear? Put on our favorite music. Let's listen to wave sounds or white noise. What can we smell? What's our favorite candle smell? Or an essential oil smell or lotion smell or laundry smell that can kind of ground us. And then what can we taste? Gum, mint, Jolly Ranchers, chewy candy. I like those uh, red hot fireballs, like those those really hard candies and that heat will help ground me and myself. <laughs> I use those personally. My kids, not so much. But finding something that works for them with your taste and your touch, like a fuzzy blanket or a squishy ball or um, anything texture that they may like. They have, you know, these fidget things and, you know, not the spinners. Those are really distracting. But it can, it can be anything, a koosh ball. Remember those, like those kind of things. And it's engaging in those senses and using all the senses to calm ourselves down and calm them down and to create this mindfulness. Remember, anger is an okay emotion to feel. It's just what we do with it that can be, it be healthy or unhealthy. And the biggest thing of all is our kids are watching us. Remember, we're messy humans. We're going to make mistakes. But they're watching. What do we do when we make mistakes? How do we grow? How do we apologize? How do we own up? What do we do differently? Our kids need us to give them permission to do these healthy things. And we can. We can. But knowledge is power, right? And so the more we know about parenting, and like I said, I was an expert really before I had children. And then I thought it was like a one fix all, you know, like you just do this and I'll fix all the things. And what I've learned is a lot of times it's taking from different, different people and different theories and techniques and rearranging and this works better for this kid this works better for this kid and that's okay to go through that process and those growing pains and experiment like what works for us but but it's mostly trying to tame ourselves and not live in this reaction piece of our life and not reacting to our children but be purposeful and responding to them remember their brains are very very underdeveloped and so they are learning and they are processing and they are growing just like we still are as fully developed brained adults we are still learning and processing and trying to grow. Give yourself grace. Give yourself grace, parents. We're learning. We're trying. We are trying. But so grateful that we serve a God that believes in grace. That believes in giving us things that we don't deserve. And now we get to take that beautiful gift and pass it on to our families. And what a, what a joy that can be when we understand and embrace grace. So again, I'm going to go over a little bit of those books again. One, Two, Three Magic by Thomas Phelan. Transforming the Difficult Child by Howard Glasser. 
Whole Brain Child by Daniel J. Siegel and Tina Payne Bryson. Those are three books that I really pull from a lot that I love that I think have really helpful, positive alternative techniques to maybe some traditional disciplining. I think that are helpful. Parents, we are in this together and we all have different struggles and we are all trying to do it differently. And the interesting thing too is we are all triggered by the things that our parents told us not to do. So as you can probably see that like, you know, for me, it's mess. I don't like mess, but I lived in a home that we liked it to be clean. And so I myself react to mess. Like I want this, it triggers me because the uh, same as I was a ch child. So we're learning, we're growing, we're trying to re rewire our brains and trying to do differently. So give yourselves grace, we're trying. Remember, you're a, hu a messy human trying to raise messy humans. But the great thing is the ability to grow and to change and to be better. All right, guys, thanks so much for spending your time with me. I hope you learned some, maybe some great little nuggets that you can apply even immediately today. And check out those books and check out those resources. And thanks so much for listening to me. And thank you so much for being able to take some of that and apply it to your homes because it's been great for me to learn through some of these authors and people who are really smart experts and for me to use them in my home and for me to use them in my work. And hopefully now you can use them in your home as well. All right, take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.